So uh, I want everybody uh, welcome to uh, Gunda for Beginning. It's a four week class. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, first bit, the slide you see up here is kind of the Master Gardeners. Uh, I assume most of you people have a pretty good idea of what we do, you've signed up for it. So if there are any questions specifically related to the Master Gardeners, who we are and what we do, uh, we, we can uh, ask, entertain those questions at the end. So Ann Randish is uh, working the, uh, the chat and uh, she'll be answering some of the questions and we'll again uh, have some more questions at the end. So uh, just some settings. Hopefully your microphone is muted, the video is off, uh, you're in the speaker view and again use chat window for questions and uh, the other master gardener and we'll be uh, monitoring the questions. So, uh, so, so welcome. So let's uh, briefly review the four-week course, and uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll have enough interest and in, uh, in, uh, to, to return for the next uh, the next three weeks. So basically, our goal in this four-week class is uh, is for you to understand uh, what plants need and uh, to give them what they need, so you can have success in your garden. So. Yes, it's gardeners for beginning, but it's also gardening for success. So uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll have enough knowledge and you'll get some basic understanding of what plants need. So uh, my name is uh, is Bob Bow. I'm a master gardener. I went through the training in 2019. Uh, I've been gardening for a long time, but only since 2019 with the benefit of the UC uh, uh, training. I've uh, converted my anecdotal uh, gardening to, my, to now more science-based. So what you will see over these uh, four classes is uh, this information will be all based on science as the, the UC has trained us and uh, they expect to pass this knowledge on, on to you and that's part of our charter. So anything that's not science-based, uh, our master gardeners will have some kind of qualifier. So there are other master gardeners uh, you'll be meeting uh, in this presentation and they'll introduce themselves uh, when their section uh, come up. One thing I hope that you realize is that uh, all master gardeners have, have a passion for gardening and sharing this science-based gardening information that UC has, has provided us. And part of this uh, uh, responsibility of getting this training is we pass it on to the community. So. Uh, Hopefully you'll uh, be able to recognize uh, this passion during this class that, that we have. Hopefully some of the topics you'll, you'll see uh, will pique your interest and uh, it'll cause you to dive deeper. And uh, in some additional classes, we'll give you some research tools to be able to um, you know, get in and find out more information. Um, just FYI, this is the third time we've taught this class, the same folks. Initially, we did it pre-pandemic. Uh, we taught it at the Camden uh, Community Center. And the last two times, uh, we've done it uh, via Zoom. So let's talk a little bit about, I'll just scroll through uh, to let you know what, what these other classes are going to entail. Uh, the first week is obviously the basic plant needs, as I mentioned. Uh, I'll be talking about the climate. Uh, Susan will talk about the sun. Paul will talk about soil. Uh, Denise will do space. And uh, Louise will talk about the water. So that's uh, basically the, the first class. Uh, next class. And, um, this is how, do, how does your garden grow? Uh, and uh, one of the things that this will uh, teach you is uh, give me some information as, as to uh, find out about uh, what's going on in your garden. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, as we all know, on the internet. And some of it's not all valid. So what we have uh, learned and one of the most valuable things I've learned in my training is to find authoritative and relevant uh, information on the web. And, and that's one of the things that uh, these tools will, will give you in, on, on week two. Uh, week three, uh, choosing the plants and uh, in, in, in keeping them uh, safe. Uh, part of that is, uh, is shopping in the nurseries and, and, the, and the seed catalogs, uh, similar to maybe not the same extent, but when, you, when, when you're buying a car, you don't just go into the showroom and uh, point to a car and I'll take that one. Well, maybe uh, plant shopping is not quite as, uh, as 
serious as that, but the process is somewhat the same. Uh, you need to do some research, uh, go into the nursery, having an idea what you want. And uh, with the information that you've gleaned here, hopefully you have a better idea of, uh, of the right plants that, that you'll need. In addition to that, uh, there's a great uh, UC site, the IPM. It's the Integrated Pest Management, and that uh, allow you to diagnose, treat, and manage uh, most pests and disease that you'll encounter. And finally, week four, oops, uh, myself, uh, that's working the garden. That's basically when the, the shovel meets the soil. And we'll talk about some tools and, and some other things. So anyway, that's, that's the close. That's the course, all four classes. Uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll, you'll want to stick around for all of my, I think you'll get a great basic all around uh, view on uh, what you need to know to grow. This is something that I saw uh, on the Wall Street Journal uh, a little over a, a month ago, and it kind of resonated with me. I don't usually like to, to read slides, but uh, anyway, this was uh, basically an article by the, uh, the chairman of the Burpee Seed Catalog, and uh, it really kind of spoke to uh, gardening in the pandemic. So, so let me read that for you. Americans soon discovered a green new world in the backyard. Creating gardens gave stir crazy individuals a fresh perspective and a break from stress and close quarters. In the garden, they felt the sense of belonging and a measure of control. And gardening's appeal crosses political lines. Now, how often does that happen these days? The gardening revolution has allowed tens of millions of people to agree on at least one thing, that food for the body and beauty for the soul are within the grasp of a seed or a plant and only a few steps from our door. So it's sort of like we've gone from uh, sheltering in place to uh, gardening in place. And so the other thing we've noticed is, uh, and the Burpee guy had figured, and mentioned that in the last two years, his plant growth is on almost 80% a year. So anyway, gardening is, uh, is more than just a surge in monumental sales increases. Uh, there's also its transformation uh, that hopefully will uh, shape American culture for generations. So hopefully I'm uh, part of a little bit of passion for the gardening and, and the impact it's had on the pandemic. Well, so, so this is, uh, in, in my mind, this is a picture of myself and my two grandkids. Uh, in my mind, gardening is not a solitary uh, endeavor, or it's not just for the joy of growing, harvesting, and sharing produce. It's also about sharing these wonderful, fun, healthy experiences with family and friends. So in gardening, we can grow not only garden produce, uh, but also lasting family memories and encourage some healthy eating habits. Now, hopefully that's something I've done with my grandkids. So if you're having trouble getting your kids eat vegetables, let them garden. My kids will eat anything that comes out of that garden. So let's talk a little bit just about the picture and, and, and what I've done. Uh, at summer, you have plenty of squash and I do too. And I would take the squash, walk it up my, uh, my cul-de-sac and uh, it felt like people were uh, closing their blind, blind doors, shutting the doors, turning off the lights. Please, Bob, no more squash. So my grandkids live down in Southern California. So when they come up, I try to have some, try to create some memory in the garden for them. So what I did is I, I took a lot of the squash and I hid it, I hid it in these plants. And we had a, we had a, a, a zucchini hunt. And so hopefully uh, I've, I've made a memory for men, for them on that one. The next one, this is my last grandkid picture. Uh, I did the same thing with potatoes. Uh, they came up, I had potatoes in a, in a raised bed. I, with a, a spade and fork, I dug up uh, the ground, gave them a little bit of shovels and, and let them have, you know, harvest the potatoes. So anyway, that is what uh, my, my passion. So now that I've kind of shared some gardening information about me, it's uh, let's find out more about you. So I, Denise is next with the poll, please. Hi, I'm Denise. I'm also a master gardener. Uh, by the way, that's what the MG is in front of the names of the people uh, on the uh, in the Zoom recording. MG stands for master gardener. 
So the first thing we're gonna start with is a poll to uh, let you say something about what you plan on doing or what you're interested in as far as gardening goes. Okay. So I've just launched a poll, hopefully you all see it. Um, I'm asking about the space you'll be gardening in. So if you guys can all start answering, you can answer as many as you wish. Uh, if you have a small yard and balcony pots, or if you have a sun area and a shade area, um, we'll just let it run for about a minute here and uh, see how many responses we get. So some of you will have a lot of space to garden in and some of you will have small spaces. As I said before, some of you will have a lot of sun, some of you will have a lot of shade. So actually it's interesting, a lot of people are interested in raised beds. So we'll let it go another few seconds here, see if we can get 100% participation. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the poll now because we have a second one we're gonna run. See a couple people are still responding. And we'll look at this information and, and summarize it for you later. So I'm gonna end this poll. Actually, I can go ahead and share the results. So you can see that, um, again, raised beds were the most popular, 55%. A lot of you have sun, which is good, 65%. A lot have shade, which can be a, a little challenging to grow plants in. All right, I'm gonna start a new poll, which is what you wanna grow. So this one asks what kinds of plants you're interested in growing. And again, answer as many as you like, it's multiple choice. Some of you will wanna grow ornamental shrubs and trees. Some people wanna grow perennials. A lot of people are interested in California native plants and a lot of people are interested in drought tolerant plants, which overlap a lot, but aren't exactly the same. A lot of people are interested in meadows and ornamental grasses these days, vegetable gardening, fruit trees, and then some people have specialty plants that they wanna grow like roses or succulents. So again, just check all that apply. Looks like we have a lot of people interested in vegetable gardening. And we'll let it go another 20 seconds or so. Yeah, vegetable gardening is by far the most popular. And some of you have questions which you're welcome to go ahead and type into the ch chat and uh, Anne can answer some of them now and some of them we'll save for later in the in the class or at the end of the class. Okay, it looks like we're just about done. I'm not seeing any new answers. All right, so I'm gonna end this poll and share the results. I hope everybody can see them. Uh, so not so many people interested in ornamentals, but a lot of people interested in perennials and California native plants and drought tolerant plants. A lot of people interested in vegetable gardens and fruit trees, and then some specialty plants. Okay, and we'll probably look at this and see if there's anything we should add to the class based on this as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing this. Okay, just close this, all right. So. All right, so just a brief intro to class one. I think Bob already mentioned a lot of the stuff we're gonna cover. Just to encourage you again to type questions into chat as they come up during the class and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the class. So class one is all about what plants need. And in this class, we're going to cover the basic needs of plants, sun, soil, and water. And knowing a plant's needs will allow you to plant the right plant in the right place which will make gardening a lot easier. It's taking a while to load the uh, pictures. All right, so this slide shows five different plants and they all have different needs. 
and we're going to, uh, well, let me first identify the plants. So on the top left, we have a lemon tree. On the bottom left, we have an azalea plant. In the middle is a California oak tree. On the upper right is a rosemary plant. Um, a lot of these are blooming right now with light blue flowers. They're very pretty, either light or medium blue flowers. And the bottom right are tomatoes, obviously from several different plants. So this is just showing the produce, it's not showing the actual plant. But each of these plants, we need to know what kind of environment or what, what does it like to grow? Does it need full sun or shade? Does it need rich soil or native soil? Does it need a lot of water or a little water? So I'm waiting for the slide to change here. All right. So now up at the top, we've said what each of these plants needs. A lemon tree needs moderate water, it needs full sun, and it needs native soil with some amendments. The azalea, on the other hand, needs lots of water, it really likes shade, and it needs well amended soil. The oak tree needs no summer water, it needs full sun and native soil. The rosemary needs little to no summer water, full sun and native soil. And a tomato needs lots of water, lots of sun, and loose, well amended soil. So if we wanted to grow each of these plants, we would first of all have to make sure we have at least enough sun and shade for the plants that we wanna grow. And then we also have to make sure, um, well, anyway, if we wanna grow all five of these, what we would do is we would group them. Again, I'm waiting for the slide to change. All right. So here we've grouped the plants into three areas. We've got the azalea, which is off by itself because it's, all, it's the only one that needs shade and it needs lots of water. It also needs well amended soil. Uh, the, uh, the two that we've grouped together here are the oak and the rosemary because they both like full sun. They both like little to no water and they both like native soil. And then we've grouped the tomato and the lemon together because they both need some soil amendment, they need a moderate amount of water, and they need full sun. So for instance, we would never wanna put the azalea next to an oak tree because their needs are just so different. We'd be watering the azalea and we'd be giving the oak too much water. And I'm waiting for the next slide. So this is another uh, example of right plant, right place. These, this is a Calamagrostis Carl Furster, which is a kind of grass. These are both planted in my, uh, in the grounds of the place where I live. They were both planted at the same time, six years ago. And in the left-hand picture, there's actually three plants here. There's one in the front and two towards the back. And you can see they're very little and scrawny. And here on the right are also three plants, but they're much more lush. They have a lot of foliage. They have a, a, a stalk that grows up in the spring and lasts all summer and into the winter. These will be cut back pretty soon. But the, the difference between these two areas for planting is strictly sun. The one on the left is under a pine tree and rarely gets mm -hmm. full sun. It's in the shade most of the time. The one on the right, is full sun. It looks shady right now, but that's because we're in the winter. In the summer, this gets full sun. Let me just see if there's anything else I wanted to say about that. Okay, and the reason we're talking about getting the right plant in the right place is because if your plant is happy, your garden will be happy and you will be a happy gardener. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Bob, who's going to talk about climate. Okay, uh, this is your first test. Okay, does anybody know the name of our, cl our climate in California? Maybe you could just put that into the chat if you can, if you, if you know the name. There's a clue, I'm not sure it'll help you much, but there are four other such climates in the world. There's only four like what we've got here. Uh, so the one thing we all have in common in the Santa Clara County is of course the climate. Uh, so why is this important to know? Well, it's what Denise had talked about, right place, uh, right plant, right place. Well, 
if you're not in the right climate, um, you know, uh, you're, you're going to have some issues. You're going to have to take special care. So, so in this uh, section, not only we talk about the climate, we'll also we'll name the climate. Hopefully, some of you got this right. Describe its attributes. We'll talk about zones. Uh, various zones that we're in. There's a hardiness zone we'll talk about, and then uh, more specific uh, the, the, the climate zones. So it's time to reveal to see who got it right. It's the Mediterranean climate. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about first the geography of what we've got. So, no, we are not uh, all that unusual. There's four other places uh, like what we have here. And just going around uh, clockwise, the Mediterranean, obviously, that's where the name comes from, Mediterranean basis. Uh, then further down, uh, Western and South Australia, uh, Western Cape of South Africa, and the Central Chile, and of course, California. So uh, the people that got the Mediterranean guess right, uh, uh, see if you're on a roll, I've got another question for you. When you look at this map, what did these Mediterranean climates all have in common? And the people didn't get the Mediterranean right, maybe it's time to redeem yourself. You get back on the scoreboard here. But uh, so when you look at this, one thing that's uh, fairly obvious, obviously, and I've got it shaded, is you see the latitude, the 30 to 45 degrees north and south of the equator. They're all located in that, uh, in that latitude band. So that's one thing they all have in common. Another thing you'll have to notice is that they seem to be on the, on the western side of the continent. Uh, and so they're, and, and they're all coastal. Uh, so uh, the temperatures obviously are moderated by you know, the westerly breezes uh, from, from the ocean. Now, California is kind of unusual in, in that it's probably more Mediterranean than the actual Mediterranean is. Uh, and one of the reasons it's unusual, because if you look at it, we probably occupy at least 10 degrees latitude, which is a little bit more than some of the other ones. We also have some unusual uh, physiographic and, and maritime influences. But the one thing is that we have uh, mountain ranges uh, going uh, north and south. Uh, and also, you know, in relationship to the Pacific Ocean, we get kind of the the cold Pacific Ocean and the, some of the major factors that makes our client. And many of many ma mi micro climates uh, within California, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so we'll give you one example of a microclimate in our Santa Clara County. So anyway, that's, that's kind of the, the geography of that. So let's go. Okay. So we talked about geography, now, now the actual climate. This is a Sunnyvale uh, rainfall. And uh, I think we're all painfully familiar with, uh, with this chart. And so what is it telling us? Obviously in the uh, summer months, there's not a lot of rain. Uh, and so we get basically 85% of our rain in the year is, is, in the, uh, is in the winter months, if we're lucky. Uh, you noticed here in January at the bar, we didn't get any of this this, uh, this month. And February is not off to a good start. Uh, so we're, we are very dependent on the water uh, coming on in, those, in the winter months. Uh, and actually the, the other Mediterranean areas, basically they have maybe 65% of the, uh, of the precipitation uh, in, the, in the winter months where we get you know, 85%. So uh, what that means is that if your plant is not native to this area, uh, probably needs some irrigation during the summer months. You probably have lived in some parts of the country where it does rain in, in the summer, not, not, not so much here. Uh, so that's why we're like a Mediterranean climate, but actually more so in our dependency of rain in, in the winter months. Uh, the other thing is, uh, well, another question. So of the plants that Denise talked about, which ones would probably work here without a whole lot of help? 
and if I recall correctly, I think probably tomatoes, not so much because they're gonna, they're, they're not native and they're gonna need some irrigation in the summer months is when they grow. Uh, probably uh, the uh, rosemary and the, uh, and the oak tree will probably be okay. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the, uh, look at the rain, Sunnyvale, 15 inches of rain a year, uh, 63 rainy days and 260 sunny days. Ben Lohman, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, that's 22 miles away. And look, it gets 50 inches of rain, uh, a little more than 3x. So uh, what's, why is it such a difference in rain? And you may have heard the, the, the Cat Stevens song, Moon Shadow. It's not a moon shadow. This is called the San Jose Rain Shadow. And we'll talk about it in the next slide is gives you an idea what this thing is. Let's see, there we go. What happens, so I would say Ben Lohman is probably right there. And so the, uh, the rain clouds move up the mountains and basically drop all their moisture uh, before they get to the top. And when they're heading down, uh, it's much drier. And so that's why uh, San Jose, Sunnyvale gets a lot less rain. We, we had this rain shadow, unfortunately. It's kind of the, the rain shadow. Now this, this is the one kind of puts it all together. In addition, you've already seen the, the, the rain bars, but the, the, uh, the red chart is actually the precipitation, or actually the temperature, I'm sorry. So you can see what we talk about in Mediterranean, it's dry, warm summers, right in that area, right in here. And then you have wet, cool winters. So that's that's the Mediterranean uh, climates. Uh, so again, if you don't have a plant uh, that's not native to this area, uh, you, you're gonna need some, they're gonna need additional care. Okay. So we probably need a little bit more detail. It's not just, just knowing the climate is, is not sufficient. Uh, knowing, uh, your climate is important, but there's more granular uh, detail that's probably required. And so this is basically a hardiness uh, graph. And so we put zones in here to tell you, uh, you know, what, what the temperature that these plants need to survive. So you'll see in Northern Minnesota, so the, these, the temperature bands you see here, they're in tents, 10 degrees in each band. Uh, so uh, Northern Minnesota, I think is hardy to a three, which means it could be planted outside in Northern Minnesota with a low temperature of minus 30 to minus 40 and it would survive. You know, I can't think of what would survive in that temperature other than maybe a popsicle, but anyway, that, that's not that's something I wanna be. Uh, zone 10, uh, in their zone, uh, actually, most of California is in zone nine, which is 20 to 30 degrees. But uh, my personal hardiness is, is a zone 13, which is like 70 to 80. But anyway, so this is very, a very broad, non specific uh, brush on the zones, but it will be important. And there is, uh, Anne, I think, has provided a, a link where you can put in your address and you can find out what your hardiness zone is specifically. So, so the hardiness zone, of course, is, is pretty broad brush. There's another one, it's called the Sunset Climate Zones. And Sunset uh, was a, is a magazine, it's still being published, but uh, what was really uh, interesting, there's a, uh, a Sunset uh, Western Garden book, which I think is in its ninth edition. And they came up with these uh, climate zones in California. So it goes from one, which is the coldest, to 24, which is the warmest. So these zones make finer distinctions about low temperatures and also take into account additional factors such as average high temperatures, proximity to the ocean, length of the growing season, and, and average frost dates. Frost, uh, dates. Uh, so in the sunset system, uh, Santa Clara is largely zones 15 and 16. Uh, some you can see are sevens, but that it's in like the Santa Cruz Mountains and the, in the Diablo range. 
The other thing that's important to note is in this, they also have the, uh, the, uh, the, the frost uh, zones. The first frost in our area, which is zone for 15, uh, the first frost, earliest expected date would be November 15th. And the last frost date in our area will be March 15th. But that doesn't mean after March 15th, you can put in your, your tomatoes or your squash. No, you probably should do that more uh, mid-April or after that. But uh, so the last frost date, frost date is not a reliable metric for when the summer plants come in. So uh, if you look at that, I think most of the people hopefully are probably in, uh, in zone 15. So uh, next, I think Susan is gonna talk about sun. Susan? Thank you, Bob. Hi, my name is Susan Homer and I'm also a master gardener. I was in the same class of 2019 as Bob and our, the rest of the people here on this uh, talk today. So today I'm gonna to talk about sun. So what do plants need? As we heard earlier, they need sun, soil, and water to grow and prosper. Plants respond to the amount of sunlight they receive and also to the intensity of that light. Many fruit and vegetable and ornamental plants need high intensity light. So they develop their maximum color and for the highest sugar levels, which will result in the best flavor for the ornamental plants. We've probably all had a plant or two that has had lacked insufficient has lacked sufficient sunlight. What happens is that it often fails to grow well and it will lean heavily toward the nearest source of sun. To maximize the best plant development, you need to give it the best sunlight for its growing needs. Recall that slide that Denise showed earlier of the two plants, one planted in the sun and one planted in the shade. And you can see what happens when it gets too much shade. So like us, plants need food to grow, but they contain the remarkable ability to produce the food they need by themselves. The process is called photosynthesis and plants use the energy from the sun to convert carbon dioxide from the atmosphere together with soil nutrients and water into food for themselves. And the sugar or glucose they produce fuels their growth. So when you're planting your garden, as we've seen from some of the earlier slides, it's really important to know where the sun is throughout the growing season. The angle and location of the sun at sunrise and sunset varies seasonally and creates different sunlight and shadow patterns throughout the day. And because most of us live in an urban environment, our shadow patterns are also affected by the location of buildings and fences and trees nearby. Some of you have had said you're going to be gardening on a balcony. So is it in full shade during part of the year? Mostly, what is it like during the spring and summer, which is the peak growing season for many of the plants? In your garden, were you seeking shade or was your space luxuriant with cool shadows during the hot months of the summer? The shadows are nice for us, but not so great for plants like tomatoes and rosemary that really need full sun for at least six hours in the daytime to grow well. Is your growing space large and unimpeded by shadows as these two locations? You're a lucky person. Most of us are not so lucky. The pattern of the sun throughout the year really matters. On the left is a photo of a garden that has more shade than sun throughout the year. And while camellias do well, it would not be a good place to grow sun-loving plants or flowering plants or most vegetables. On the left, you could see a garden where one side is in the bright sunlight, but the angle of the sun and the structure behind it, you don't see it, but this shadow is caused by a building, I mean that most of this part of the garden is in the shade throughout the day. And different plants will do better in each type of sunlight exposure. So what you want to do is track the pattern of the sun and the shadow throughout your garden. We're in the winter now, but you'll be doing most of your gardening in the spring, summer, and in our very temperate climate in the fall. This photo shows a garden midday in November. The strong 
shade pattern is caused by a building that's outside of the range of the photo. In the summer, at the same time of day, this area is in full sun. If this is your first year gardening, you're gonna to wanna to track sunlight more intensively than those who have gardened in their space for a period, of, a longer period of time. You want to know what the pattern of sun and shadow is going to be on your growing space. You can observe the sun's track as it goes throughout the day. And you could see whether your neighbor's house or your favorite blue spruce tree will block the sun on any given day. But that's gonna change throughout the year unless you live near the equator. A sun path chart will show the position of the sun at a specific location during different times of the year. It's a very valuable tool, especially if you are new to a, a gardening location. Once it's oriented properly, a sun path chart can tell you when a tree, a hill, or a building will cast a shadow on your potential garden location. If you're interested, you can find a sun path chart on the internet, or you could just go and get the app that, but that will tell you the same thing. And so now we're going to go to Paul, who's gonna talk about soil. Hi everyone, I'm Paul. I've been gardening for a few years since uh, I grew up in, in the UK and I had a, a mother that was fascinated with it. And it took me a few years, but I followed, followed suit. It was funny hearing Bob talk about the Mediterranean climate. I grew up in South Africa and I remember my mom visited and we were driving up 280 and she was looking at the hills around and said, yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a gazelle hop over the hill any moment now. So it's really incredible that the climates really are very similar in all those different places. So what about soil? What is in soil? It's not really just a bunch of dirt. It is this fascinating substance that is teeming with not just uh, kind of ground up rocks, but a huge number of animals and plant material and fungi. So it's about half solid, half space. And of the solids, it is ground up rock and a small amount of organic matter, which is anything that's kind of broken down um, that was living at some point or is still living. But the key to deciding what type of solid you have is how much space there is what, and what's in that space. For example, a sandy soil is, has very large particles and drains water very well. Whereas on the other end of the scale, we have clay, which is primarily what we have in Santa Clara County. And that is a very, very fine, silty substance. And they, they have different advantages and disadvantages. And you can even have combinations of them. So for example, a, a loamy soil is somewhere in between, it's between sand and, and clay. Where I am in Sar Saratoga, which is near West San Jose and Campbell, I have a kind of a combination of sand and clay. I've got a little bit here. I don't know how easy this is gonna to be to see. But you can see there are, there's a good amount of space in there and it moves pretty easily, but if it gets wet, it gets pretty sticky and muddy. So, the good thing about clay, and people think, people think that it's frustrating to garden in clay because it doesn't drain very well and it, it's hard to work with and it's heavy and it requires a lot more effort to move around, but it does maintain nutrients extremely well. And if you have a small amount of sand in there, which is what we do, <clears throat> you have a fantastic growing environment. And, you know, we all know this is one of the best places really in the world for, for growing. So we're really blessed with that. So if you have tough soil to work with, you can do something called amending. And that is essentially mixing in organic matter. So the most common thing that you might amend is with compost. You can also buy soil amendment in, in the garden stores and that works 
just as well. It's a lot of effort to get it in there. You have to use a, uh, a fork and shovel and kind of get in and, and mix it. But it will really pay off because it will provide that, that air for the oxygen to help growth. And then it will provide the, the ability to retain the moisture in the organic material. Let's move on to the next one. So what's compost? It's essentially anything that was alive and is now decomposed. At the point where it will no longer decompose, it's called hummus. And I've got a couple of examples of compost. So this here is some leaves that I shredded about two months ago. So the Thanksgiving break, I cleared my yard of leaves. Don't use a leaf, leaf blower because we can use it. And here is another type of comp compost that is processed by worms. So this, this is much finer and it's pretty much at the end of, end of the stage and I can use that in the garden. So what does the compost do? It provides nutrients, uh, provides the soil and air that we talked about, um, and it provides food for the living organisms that are in the soil. So I'm not, we're not really going to get into making compost, but essentially, if you can make about a three foot by three foot space in your yard and then collect what we call greens and browns, those are kind of the dry woody materials for the browns and then the moist green materials like grass clippings or, or uh, fresh leaves. You can mix those together and essentially allow it to just do its thing. You don't need to add anything to it. Everything is already there. What I do is I have it in a, in, in, a, in a bin, essentially, and then I'll turn it maybe once a week and make sure it's moist enough. So I'll just sprinkle water on it, put my fork in there, turn it around, get it all evenly mixed, and then pretty much just leave it. And within a few months, you've got an amazing addition to your soil. So how do you protect that soil? Well, there's something called mulch. And mulch is really anything that is applied to the top of the soil to protect it. So it can be leaves, wood chips, bark chips, straw, um, compost. It's actually even possible to use rubber mulch. Um, there is it's a use of a recycled tire and actually works pretty well. You can use rocks and gravel as well. So essentially, mulch, mulch does two main things. It protects the soil from direct sunlight. And direct sunlight tends to dry out and bake the top of the soil. And that in turn provides protection so that the moisture is conserved within, within the soil. Another thing that it does is when you if you're watering from above, then it distributes the water to the soil. So rather than having a jet of water or a concentration in one area, it will, it will spread it out. The final, the final thing I think is important is, especially these days with climate change and increasing temperatures, is it keeps the temperature of the soil even so that anything that is living within there is not as exposed to extremes of temperatures. Mulch is, I would say, is the secret, the secret to getting amazing soil. So what about nutrients? Well, one of the great things about where we are is outside of vegetable gardening, in my experience of about 10 years in this, this area, is I've hardly used fertilizer at all. But I think it's important to at least understand what's, what's in it and how to read it for when you do need fertilizer, for example, growing your own tomatoes. So we have three primary uh, chemicals in fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And 
they're given their uh, chemical names, N, P, and K. It's uh, got a little bit more to say on that. So the main thing about these four is nitrogen allows the chlorophyll, the, the, the green part of the plant to grow. Um, phosphorus is for root growth, seeds and flower form, formation. So for example, at the beginning of a, of a vegetable's growth, it would need nitrogen. And then when the buds start appearing and flowering, typically it needs more phosphorus. Now there's already a lot of phosphorus and potassium in our soil, so there isn't really any need to add to it. Um, it's only if you're intensively growing in one spot and for whatever reason you choose not to amend it or uh, have a plant that's particularly demanding. So for example, uh, tomatoes do use a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. Outside of MPK, there's a whole collection of micronutrients that are sort of like our vitamins, like iron and magnesium and calcium. But for the most part, it's, we don't really need to worry about that. So I will now pass it over to Louise to talk about water. Hi, let's see. Need to, am I showing? I can't see on the screen. Hang on a second. Sorry. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Louise. I've been a master gardener since 2011, and I'm going to talk briefly about water. We'll be covering watering in, in more detail in future classes, but right now we're just going to get a quick overview. So along with the right climactic conditions, the right amount of sunshine, good soil, plants need water. In fact, about 90% of a plant is water. So for comparison, it's only 65% for a human. But just like in a human or in any living thing, water is necessary for the chemical reactions that provide the plant's energy for photosynthesis and that allow the plant to make new cells and grow. Water is also really important for plant structure. Hydrostatic pressure, which is also called turgor, within the plant cells keeps the plants rigid so that it will not wilt. Precipitation and irrigation are the way that plants get water on, the way that water gets onto the ground so that plants can take it up. The water goes into the soil where it's drawn up through the roots into the vascular conducting tissue of the plant. Water uptake is driven by the loss of water through the leaves, which is called transpiration. Transpiration is similar to sweat in people. The more you sweat, the thirstier you will be. It's the same for plants. The more water they lose through their leaves, the more they will draw up from the soil. On a hot day, a medium-sized fruit tree can use up about 16 gallons of water in a day. Think about that, it's a lot of water. Water also evaporates directly from the soil surface, drying the soil out. As gardeners trying to keep our plants happy, we need to keep an eye out on how much water is in the soil and how fast it dries out. Remember from what Bob said, here in Santa Clara County, it rains in the winter, but not in the summer. So in the summer, the only source of water for your plants is irrigation. That is water supplied by you, the gardener. The soil will dry out much faster in the heat of the summer than it will in the cool of the winter. So as you no may have noticed, it rained in December. The soil is still pretty moist, even though it hasn't rained in January. But if this was July, the soil would be dried out and hard. So we have to provide water for our plants in the summer here in Santa Clara County. Thinking back to what Paul said about soil, remember that in general, about half the volume of soil is actually empty space, which contains air and water. Plants need both air and water in the soil to grow well. Too much water is as damaging as too little. 
different types of plants need different amounts of water in the soil. For instance, plants that naturally grow in a swamp, they're going to love to be waterlogged most of the time. Not all the time. They need oxygen too in their roots, but most of the time. While plants that naturally grow in a desert might just need a tiny bit of water. The plants we usually grow in our gardens are somewhere in between. The key is that you as the gardener need to start paying attention to how much water your plants need to stay healthy. A lot of garden problems are water related. The picture on the left shows a plant that is wilting because there isn't enough water reaching the leaves to maintain the turgor, to maintain their structure. But most of the time, beginners tend to overwater because watering is something we can do for the plant. You look sad, I'll give you some water. That's often not the right answer. Um, like in the picture on the right, the trees in those planters are actually drowning because there is zero water there, or sorry, zero air there in that soil for those plants. So you can easily drown your plants with too much water. We're gonna talk a lot more about how to make sure your plants get the water they need in the next three classes. But for now, the takeaway is your plants may need a little water or they need a lot of water, may need a lot of water, but they all need some water. And now Denise will be talking about space. Yes, um, I'm back. Actually, I don't see myself again. Uh, so space is another fundamental need of, of plants in addition to sun, soil, and water. So spacing refers to both the height, the width, and the root area of the plant. And this slide from PG&E um, shows one big concern about planting trees, whether they will interfere with power lines. And they also talk about possible damage to the underground utility lines from the tree roots. You want to keep large trees away from buildings too, to avoid damage to the foundation from the roots or to the building itself from branches. And you have to think about how big the tree is going to get when it's mature in 10 or 20 years. Some trees only get to 20 feet tall, as they've noted here under the utility lines, they want short trees. These trees are just naturally smaller. Other trees can get to be 60 feet or more tall. And you need to know that when you plant the tree. For instance, an oak tree, it's hard to believe that a skinny leafless stick that you buy at the nursery will actually grow into a huge tree, but it will. So there are, here are some questions you want to ask, even with smaller plants, not just trees. How tall will the plant get? Think about power lines, of course, but also where will it cast shade? Is the shade useful or a problem? Even in a vegetable garden, you wouldn't want to plant something tall like tomatoes where they would shade the rest of your garden. You also want to see how wide it will get, how much room is needed between plants or between the plant and structures. Don't plant trees next to the house because the roots can damage the foundation. And then lastly, you want to know if the plant needs any support, if it's a vine, for instance. And if so, what kind of support it needs. Some vines get really big and heavy, like wisteria and kiwis, and they need very substantial trellises or arbors. Here we're looking at a couple of plants that were the, the final size was not considered when they were planted. The Colorado blue spru spruce on the right was planted right up against the side of the building. Not only does the tree look funny, growing at an angle to get away from the building, but its roots are probably damaging the building's foundation. The azalea on the left was planted too close to the driveway, so it has been unattractively sheared back. You've got this big gaping brown space uh, in that azalea. Lives seem to be especially slow. Don't fool yourself into believing that a large plant will work in a small area. This leafy, viney type plant on the ground with the orange and yellow flowers uh, spreads. And if you plant a plant like this along the sidewalk, it's gonna cover the sidewalk and you'll constantly be cutting it back, making more work for yourself. Unless you want to let the path get overgrown like this, this is Monet's garden in Giverny in France. So it's intentional. But notice the zigzag path through the center, 
the gardeners still have to be cutting back the plant to leave that zigzag path to maintain any pathway at all. All right, I'm waiting for the slide to advance. Here's an example where the gardener is actually giving plants enough space. Now remember that the spacing needed depends on the plant. If these were trees and bushes, they would be way too close. But this is an ornamental vegetable garden just being planted in March. Look how bare it looks, how far apart those tiny plants are. It's hard to believe even for experienced gardeners sometimes that those little plants will need all that room. So that was in March. And this is how that garden, those pet plant has filled, that area has filled in by August. It's even a little crowded. So how do you know how much room plants need? Again, you can't usually tell by looking at the plant. You'll need to read their tags, look them up in reference books or on the web, talk to fellow gardeners, observe the plants in other people's yards. Remember that putting the right plant in the right place will make both the plant and you happy. The plant is more likely to survive and look beautiful and it'll be less work for you to maintain it. Now Louise is gonna talk about looking at your, your personal garden, analyzing your personal gardening space. Hi again. Um, now that you have some background on the plants needs for climate and sun and soil and water and space, you can start to think about how your garden area can provide for plants needs. Can, can people hear me? Please say yes, for some reason my yes or no. Okay, thanks. All right, so what you're gonna be wanting to do is start to analyze and observe your own garden space. Whether you're gonna be gardening in a pot or um, on a patio or, um, you know, in a two acre space or in just a, a little tiny, you know, sliver of your backyard, you, you really want to be uh, analyzing what, what your space offers to plants. And you'll be a much better gardener if you do this. It's a lifelong process. The more you garden, the more you're gonna find yourself assessing every little spot, asking yourself, what does that little tiny corner by my driveway offer to a plant? that will help you be a better gardener. So let me give you a couple of examples, or I'll just give you one example actually here. So this is a map that our friend Isabel made before she remodeled her front yard. And you can see that it's really very rough. It doesn't have to be fancy, but she has put a lot of thought into mapping out the space and not, there's no plants on here, right? It's not about the plants yet. It's about the garden space. So you can see in the corner up by the house on, on the upper left, that's like that corner by the driveway in the house where everybody has a really shady spot. She's really made, made sure that she noted that. Um, whereas in the lower middle part, it's full sun and she noted that. Um, she noted on the left some places that have afternoon sun, but those are probably shady in the morning. And then on the right, oh, that's an area that gets morning sun. Um, and then up there by the house, you can see where she said, this is a sunny spot in the summer, but it's shady in the winter. Remember the diagram that Susan showed of how different the angle of the sun in the summer and the winter um, affects the how that how the, how different that angle is and how that affects the sun um, or the shade that we have in our garden near buildings in the summer and the winter. And then of course she always she, she made a note of where north was. You can see that on the far right because you want to know where north and south are in your garden because the sun is in the southern sky and um, parts of your garden that are exposed to the sun will be generally facing more towards the south. So, so you can see it's not it's not fancy. It's not done with any kind of fancy software or anything. It's just a piece of paper and a pencil. So what we'd like you to do is for next week, this is your homework, analyze your own garden space, whether it's just a little balcony hanging off your apartment 
or whether it's an entire garden or it's just a section of your yard, sketch a picture of it, sketch a map of it, include objects like the fences and the sidewalks and the patios and arbors, um, put in the big trees and hedges and things that you're, you'll, you'll always want to keep. Um, Mark where water faucets are, where you have other kinds of infrastructure that's important, like maybe a raised bed or where you might like to put a raised bed. And then um, thinking about what Susan said, observe the sun and the shade patterns and mark the sunny and shady areas on your sketch. And of course, mark which way is north. Um, so do yourself a sketch, analyze, think about how does your garden space provide especially sun, but also soil and, and you know, where, where you have good soil, where you have soil that you're not so sure about, that kind of thing. Think about your space in terms of plants needs. And if you want to, you could email it to me at louisedchristy at gmail.com. And I'll take a look at them and maybe pick a couple of them. I could share them with my colleagues here and we could pick a couple of them to share with the, the group next week. Um, again, it doesn't have to be fancy, but it will get you thinking like a gardener. So I'm going to turn things over to Susan now. Okay. So what I am going to be doing is demonstrating how to plant some seeds. We decided that since this is a beginning gardening class, and while we haven't talked very much about seeds yet, it's a four week class. And in the period of four weeks, for those of you especially who have not done this previously, you're gonna see the wonder of seeds in a garden. And it's a real simple process. This is something just to demonstrate how to do it. I'm not going to be doing it in the garden itself, but showing how easy it is to seed something. So I've just taken a cup, just a paper cup here, and I'm going to plant in that paper cup, I'm going to plant sugar snap peas. I actually have some of these sugar snap peas growing in my garden right now. I planted them um, very early in the winter and they are all the way at the top of a six foot trellis at this point. So what I plant in this cup actually will fill a six foot trellis eventually. And it's going to be producing some beautiful peas, which I hope I could show you by the end of the week four of the class, not from this one, but from the one that's out in the garden. So to plant something like this, simple. I'm going to make sure that there is drainage. We saw that slide where those trees were drowning in their own water. So I have a ice pick, just putting some holes in the bottom of the cup. I'm going to take... Um, Excuse me, um, Susan, just one minute. Bob, can you stop sharing the screen so we can get a bigger picture of Susan? Thanks. So I'm going to put some potting soil. This is just general potting soil. And remember, this is going in a pot so that I'm using potting soil, not garden soil. And I'm going to fill this cup with this soil. There we go. I'm just gonna pat it down gently. And according to the package of seeds, it says that these should be planted in soil to the depth of one inch. Take a couple of them. Here are the peas. I chose these because they actually are pretty visible. And a pencil to make a hole to the black line because that's probably about an inch. And I'll make a few holes in there and drop a pea in each one. and tamp down the soil, firm it around there. So that's gonna be our sugar snap peas. They should be up probably in about a week. And there should be some growth on those. And then the other thing I'm going to plant, because this is actually going to produce 
hopefully, a, uh, a viable vegetable for us by the end of four weeks. These are radishes. These happen to be French breakfast radishes, which is that long radish with a white tip on it. And this is one of my favorite radishes. I have them growing in my garden right now as well. And what I'm gonna do is I've taken that soil and I put it in the pot to the top. And I'm gonna sprinkle these radish seeds on the top. And I'm sprinkling them because later on, I'm gonna to have to thin these out. And I wanted to show you the process of thinning them out. And then I'm going to put a little of the garden soil on the top because according to the package, it said that these should be planted to a depth of approximately one half inch. The interesting thing about both of these plants is that they are both cool weather vegetables, which means I do not have to apply any sort of heat to the bottom of the pot to get them to germinate. These should germinate just in our current temperatures. And I will move these out of doors. So it's a fair test of them being cool weather plants. I've got a little tray here because I'm going to water these in. Very important to water in your seeds. I'm just going to pour in some water on the top of these. and then they're off to a good start. And we'll check them every week. And if you have some seeds at your house and you haven't had a chance to pra practice planting seeds before and you wanna give it a trial, why don't you plant them along with me? And we'll see where we get them by the end of four weeks. Sugar snap peas and French breakfast radish peas in these pots. And now I think we'd like to move on to the questions that you have sent in. So Anne, would you be able to read off some of the questions and give us a chance to answer those that you haven't already answered? Sure. Um, thank you for all. There have been a lot of very interesting questions um, put into the chat. And the majority of them have to do with soil, which I, I think shows real understanding on your part that that's the foundation of a good garden. Um, first, I'm gonna ask the, the last question that just relates to what Susan was doing. And maybe Susan can, Susan can answer it. What is the difference between soil mix and potting soil? So what I have here in this bag is potting soil. Mm -hmm. It actually has ingredients in it, amendments in the soil that make it more open, Friable is the word, F-R-I-A-B-L-E, which means that it does not get compacted in the pots. It has a few more nutrients in the pots um, and it will be the right structure for plants that are grown in pots. Their roots are contained in the pots. Whereas planting mix, which you would, uh, would incorporate into the soil is not going to have the same texture or the same friability that you would use to amend your soil. Some people amend their clay soil with, with planting mix in order to give it a better capacity to uh, absorb water, to allow the roots to grow, etc. Thank you. That was very good. I know for myself, I've, I've occasionally used soil mix when I wanted to add some to some more soil to my um, raised bed, but the potting soil is what I've used for containers. Um, so we have a lot of questions about amendments. Um, Paul, uh, maybe you could answer this. What's the best time of, time of year or maybe uh, time in uh, crops growth to amend the soil? I would say I amend before I plant. Mm -hmm. So um, I recently removed a swimming pool from my backyard and the, the soil that was put in was, was, was not great. Um, and obviously I wanted to plant it. So uh, I got the fork and the shovel out and I spread quite a lot of good quality soil that I bought locally in bulk and just got to work and dug it in. 
Uh, the other time I would add amendment is if I'm pulling up an old raised bed. So say I've used it for a couple of years, um, there's been maybe some more demanding plants like uh, vegetables in there, then what I, I typically do is I pull the, uh, the soil out, I sift it into, a, um, into one of those large kind of gardening, uh, what are they called, gardening carts, I guess. And then I'll amend into that and then put it back in the, into the, into the uh, raised bed. But, so the short answer is right before you use it. And there's another question related, <coughs> excuse me, related to that. Um, how deep do you dig in the amendments? For me, it's about six inches. Mm -hmm. it depends on the plant. So if, I, if I'm planting some little succulents and I've got um, lousy soil or I, want, or I want it to be more better drainage, which is typical for a succulent, I mean, I'm just going to do a pot's worth and I'll do the whole pot. Um, if it's a vegetable, then I'm probably going to go about six inches, which is basically enough for it to kind of get rooted. And then it will find what it needs below the surface. So there's another uh, question here about soil that was really interesting, particularly interesting to me. Um, does the pH of the soil make a difference during the amendment process? And typically, the amendment process will alter the pH, depending on what the starting pH is. So if, you, if you're really interested in this, one of the things you can do is take a sample of your soil and get it sent to a lab, and they will tell you a mind-boggling amount of information about your soil, not just its um, NPK values, but things like whether it has lead or the micronutrient composition and so on. I did that for a, a big plot that I had. I mean, I say big, um, 8,000 square feet. And it was, really, it was really fascinating. It gave me all the insights I needed to put the right amount of nutrients in for the right type of plant. Different mm -hmm. plants need different things. And to know what's in there already is very useful. Like there's no, generally there's no point adding phosphorus locally. There's just plenty of it. But if you're um, low on nitrogen, which is typical, then that's something that might be worth adding. And there's lots of ways of doing that don't involve buying synthetic fertilizers. Then the, yeah, so the, there's another question about the pH and the, the pH of the soil does matter, matter for the plant growth. And that's another thing you would find out from a soil test, really, that's the only. Yeah, if you just wanted to find the pH, you can, you can buy kits online. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to send your soil to a lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and it depends also on the plant. So different plants are able to uptake the nutrients it, at different bands of pH. So for example, one particular nutrient might, that if a plant needs a particular nutrient, that particular nutrient is optimally absorbed within a range of pH. And you can learn all this on the specific plant. So you could search for say, ideal pH for whatever plant you're interested in. Yeah. Just but honestly, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Mm -hmm. Unless you're doing something really unusual. Um, it's, I haven't personally found any like abnormal pHs in any of the yards that I've worked in, which is about 10 now in Santa Clara County. So there are um, other questions. Louise, maybe I'll, I'll ask you this. Um, people are asking about reusing soil I, or potting soil. I think, I think imagine they mean in, the, uh, in a container and can you reuse the, this potting soil. Oh, you need to. Um... Sure, a, a, a lot of people ask about reusing soil in raised beds and containers. Um, a raised bed depends on how big it is. If it's a small raised bed, it's more like a container. Um, the thing about potting soil that you've put in a container and used for a year or two is A, all the nutrients are gone. 
Um, nitrogen especially has been just leached out of that because nitrogen is very mobile in the soil and it will just be leached out of the soil. Um, and But the other thing is that potting soil for containers is formulated to provide a lot of open pore space, a lot of empty space, right, for that air to get in there. And over the years, the, the organic matter in the potting soil, it basically composts right there in the container and the particle size is smaller and smaller and smaller. So two or three year old potting soil in a container is not at all the same as brand new potting soil. So if you're gardening in containers, we really recommend that you renew that soil completely, you know, ditch personally, I ditch all of it. I would take the entire pot and get rid of the, the potting soil that was in it after let's say two years and put fresh bagged potting soil in there. It makes a huge difference. Trying to reuse that soil in, a, in another container in the same container um, is not really best practice. Um, what you can do with that soil certainly is you can add it to your compost pile or you can use it as amendment in your, um, in your, your planting beds in the dirt. You know, the, 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 the soil that's not in a container or a raised bed, right? Um, with a raised bed, I would, as Paul was talking about, I would amend the raised bed soil. Presumably you're growing vegetables in your raised bed. Um, I would amend that once or twice a year with fresh compost. Um, when I used to do a lot of raised bed vegetable gardening, I always did a uh, new amendment and a new broadcast of fertilizer before every seasonal planting. So generally once in the spring and once in the fall. Thank you. So there, there are a lot of more questions about um, good amendments, um, chicken manure or mushroom compost. And I just, maybe, a, maybe it's just um, would be good to ask each one of you, what's your favorite amendment to add, say to a, a raised bed? Compost. Compost, okay. Compost. And if you don't have enough and if you don't have enough of your own compost, what would you use? Well, so Anne, here, here's yeah. the issue I found with the compost. If it's not completely uh, composted or, or, or degraded, or, uh, is that when you put it in and dig it into a raised bed, it's still composting and it'll drain the nitrogen from the soil. So if you put plants right on top of it, it's, it's not gonna work. So what I have to do now is when I put the compost in, I dig it in, and at least a month, I let it kind of cook. And then, it, and, or sometimes I'll even put fertilizer or alfalfa pellets on top to increase the, uh, the activity on there. But if you just put untreated or on uh, complete uh, compost and then you put vegetables on top, uh, the vegetables aren't going to like that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have something to add? Um, Denise or Susan? Sure. Um, I use my, like Bob, I use my own compost that I make. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of alfalfa pellet, pellets. I just love those alfalfa pellets. They're very low release uh, of, of nitrogen, but they do help my clay soil. And um, I just throw them on top of everything. I go around the neighborhood saying, want some alfalfa pellets? And, you know, mm -hmm. That's my favorite. Okay. Um, we use a lot of alfalfa pellets too, and you have to use way more than you think. It's a organic fertilizer, and so it's not as concentrated as a lot of the chemical fertilizers. Uh, I think we add what a coffee can full for every ten square feet, if not more. Um, and then we add also we use planting mix. We use some of our own compost, but we don't have enough for all of our raised beds, so we use additional planting mix to top off the beds because what you'll find is that the beds will the soil the level of soil will go down because the organic matter as Paul said is decomposing and the nutrients get taken up into the plants and so you know the, the, the level of the soil can go down two three five inches in a season. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of questions about where to get all these things like the alfalfa pellets and compost and um, Santa Clara County. Excuse uh, has, me. Santa Clara County has a web page. Mm -hmm. If you search where to compost, where to purchase compost on sccgov.org, um, you'll find a whole list of folks that sell it. 
Well, that's and also the city has free compost giveaways. Uh, do, I'm yeah. sorry, the cities in Santa Clara County have some free compost giveaways, depending on exactly where you are. You can look on the, the website again for Santa Clara County, I believe. You know, I, the only place I've found the pellets is at uh, Yamaguchi's and we're, you know, we're careful not to recommend stores, but that's where I found it. And they have them at feed stores. If you buy, um, yeah. Not the big box. You're not going to find them at the big box stores. No, they'll be at, at individual feed stores. Yes. All right. I buy them. I buy them in 50, 50 pound bags at a right. feed store. Oh, wow. But you, when you're going to a feed store, you have to make sure that you get alfalfa pellets and not rabbit pellets. Yeah, not something that's treated or has other stuff in it. it has to be just alfalfa pellets. And and you know you can call a couple of the big animal feed stores and farm supply stores that, that are in. Um, I found them mostly in the southern part of the county. Mm -hmm. Just so that people are asking, what is a feed store? I think it provides agricultural products for livestock, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Correct. just just. Um, just do a search for it and you'll find there are quite a number in a, as susan said they're more in the farming part of our county in the south so then um somebody asked here um that they're getting confused with do you add alpha alfalfa pellets or compost and i think i i can just answer that quickly that you would add both they're the um alfalfa pellets are like a slow release organic fertilizer and you want to add the compost is an amendment. And is that correct? <laughs> is anybody yeah, the correct? compost doesn't have a lot of, of it do. has some nutrients, but not a lot. It's more for soil structure and to yeah. feed the organism, organisms in the soil, whereas the alfalfa pellets has nitrogen for the plants to take up. Mm -hmm. And you could use, you don't have to use alfalfa pellets as right. fertilizer. You could also use, um, you can use any fertilizer, but Certainly you could use any organic fertilizer. Um, right. That would be fine. And always follow the package directions when you use fertilizer. Yes, that's important. Uh, let's see, I'm sure, let's, I'm gonna look at my notes here, see what else. Um, mostly about soil. And people have asked about um, raised beds and I believe we're gonna get into that more in some later classes. Are we, were we, especially the last one, we talk about actually digging. We won't talk about constructing raised beds, but we'll, we'll be talking about growing vegetables in them. Um, I think that that is probably, let me just glance at your, um, is there a video tutorial you recommend for learning about soil amending? amending? Um, yeah. Okay, go ahead. But go ahead, Louise. Your. Oh, um, sorry about soil amending clay. Yes, I, I don't know of any video tutorial um, myself. I, I do know that if you give clay a, a, a good layer of compost a couple times a year and dig that in a little bit, um, it, it's hard at first, but over the years you will see your soil dramatically change um, into that lovely soft fluffy dark stuff <laughs> that uh, you want. I, mean, Louise, we'll do you a want to... I can do a search over the week and see if we can find some videos that we can provide next yeah, time. Do that because and we also have a question someone asked about gophers eating roots. I know that's that's really common with fruit trees especially real frustration. Denise you, do you have a suggestion for that? Well you should have planted it in a gopher cage but yeah. um <laughs> Yeah, if you have gophers, it's tough. I mean, they're going to tunnel through and eat stuff. You may have, I don't know if you're sure if you have gophers or moles. Uh, gophers eat the plants. Moles tend to eat the bugs that are in the soil. Um, but we have we lost a couple of vines to, to gophers. And the next time we planted them, we planted them in what they call a gopher cage. You can find it at your local nurseries. It's basically a wire basket that protects the roots from the gophers. Yeah, there's also a hardware cloth, I guess you can put on the bottom of the raised beds, right. uh, you know, nail it or staple it or whatever. And so, uh, you know, the water drains through. But I mean, if you have a big screen like chicken wire, I mean, what the gopher can do is uh, little buggers can grab the whole plant and pull it through the through the holes in the screen. So you want to 
you want a pretty uh, concentrated screen and, and the hardware cloth seems to do the yeah. job. I've watched uh, bean plants being pulled down. <laughs> I'll break my heart. Yeah, yeah. So let's see, we're near, let's I'll look for one more question here. Oh, what is this one about, let's see. There is a question about mushroom compost and that's something I've heard some people say it is, uh, you know, that's that compost that mushrooms have grown in that sometimes it's too salty. What do you know, anybody know something of that about that? Well, I th think somebody mentioned it, it's spent compost. So mm -hmm. it feels like it's better as a mulch than as something actually in the soil, but uh, yes. I don't know that. That's another thing. You're mentioning mulch, so that's a very, um, uh, slow but sure way to improve soil too, because the um, if you put organic mulch on your soil, the worms will come up and other little insects that eat organic material, and they'll be they'll be tunneling up into the mulch and breaking it down and gradually adding it to the. It'll become part of the soil, and the soil will become more friable. Yeah. I mean, if you do that for year, you know, several years, you'll have a big difference. Yeah. And then, one. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, you, know, you know, and that's, that, that's from you using mentioned, you mentioned all the insects down below it. And that's why, you know, once you have a raised bed and you, and, you, and you do a double dig after that, you probably shouldn't till the soil anymore after that, because you're yes. going to disturb all those microorganisms, which are so important. And so that's why we sort of discourage from digging and tilling once you've uh, started the bed and Maybe just if you have some compost, don't don't bury it really deeply because you know you don't want to you don't want to fool those folks. Yes, the no-till method is being promoted yeah. to farmers now too. Yes. Yeah. So I think we we have gotten to five twenty nine, and I think we will wrap it up. We are going to save the chat so that we can answer one to the beginning of the class next next time that we weren't able to answer today. And uh, I want to thank you for spending your time with us.